Yeah, I thought you did. I, I, you really jumped into it. And so I appreciate you folks having that stuff done. Okay, we're on uh, chapter 5 and working on disinformation towards another test and somebody told me it's kind of almost before the middle of February so it'll be coming up quick. As a point of interest, by finishing up chapter 5 today, we've done 25% of the book. I mean, yeah, I know you guys are going through a whole bunch real quick, but yeah, it's got to be about 25% a month because you've got four months. Um, okay, we're dealing with the um, central nervous system. And again, we're back to the what are the parts and where are things going on. And you have the cerebellum. Okay, so the cerebellum is down here. It's that little part there, right there. And the cerebellum, it notes here, uh, four times as many neurons as in the remainder of the brain. It's gray matter. So what does that make the cerebellum? Computer. computer. Very good. It's the computer. In other words, it's where synapses are coming together, there's inner neurons, and there are decisions being made. What level of decisions are being made in the cerebellum? Test answers? Can you get a test answer out of the cerebellum? No. <laughs> but it can tell you how to run your pencil to be able to scratch out the little scantron thing. So you don't have to think real hard on it. So the, the cerebellum then is lower in the brain, brain stem, cerebellum, and so it's going to be doing some of the initial processing. And it attaches to the upper part of the brain stem at the pons and midbrain. Okay? So it attaches at the upper part of the, uh, the, the pons and the midbrain. Okay? Um, it does have the thing where you can spread out the cerebellum and so you have the, the vestibular part, the spinal part, and the central part of the cerebellum. And you can have various things. The basic position on this is not what each group does, but what they generally do as a whole. In other words, maintaining balance, vestibular, okay? The spinal part dealing with the intended movement, the actual movement. So it's fine-tuning things. And the centro uh, playing roles in planning, initiating voluntary movement. So what is, in a sense, is what goes on with the cerebellum? For sports, for thing, what is the cerebellum's going to be your thing? Is this where, uh, this is where then, if you're going to be doing the fine-tuning for gymnastics, for driving a car, for whatever it is, it's what is being processed here, not necessarily up here. You're seeing things, but you're, the, the, mo the motions and things are being maintained back here. With the brain stem uh, is the transition, again, from the spinal cord to the higher brain. In other words, everything goes through the brain stem. That's being commented about a number of times. And then the reticular activating system. I love rats of unusual size. I mean, that's, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, but maybe it'll stick in your head too. And it's part. It starts kind of down in here, and it goes up through the brain stem. And so that's the reticular activating system. Okay, looking at this thing, it's another one of those the graphs and thing diagrams in the picture. You kind of go, oh, goodness gracious, am I learning all this stuff? No, it, it's basically what it's saying here again is what passes through all parts of the brainstem, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Need a little comment. Okay, so it's the descending somatic motor tracts and the ascending somatic sensory tracts. Okay? So in other words, now we're getting a little more specific. Everything passes through the, the brainstem, and this is what's passing through it. Going up and down. And so you have the descending somatic, and what's somatic refer to? muscle, anything other than reproductive. Okay, so then you have the, the uh, ascending somatic sensory and the somatic motor tracks. Okay, what choice of events is made? The rate of action potentials can be made faster and reinforced. The rate of the action potential can be slowed and made, oh, we, that's all about IPSPs and EPSPs, right? Got it. Okay, so that's this particular slide. You don't have to do all the stuff that's there, just showing you a diagram of 
with the great knowledge on the left side. Okay, kind of as a little quick little basic thing. A nerve is not the same as a neuron. Oh, don't be on a test and go nerve and neuron the same thing. Here's the axon there. That is what? The neuron. One neuron. Okay? Do you have the axon, myelin sheath, a whole bunch of the neurons put together, connect the tissue around that. You have it all bundled together in the fossicle. A whole bunch of them bundled together becomes the fossicle. Okay, and you can see in the, uh, uh, the electron microscopy picture, yeah, it can be really complicated. Now, this particular thing dealing with the cranial nerve basics, here are the basics here. You don't need to memorize this. I did long ago in some class somewhere, and it's downright entertaining, but it's, it's not required for the test and things, so don't panic on the right diagram. It's the information here. Cranial nerves are, in, are paired. They originate in different parts of the brain stem, midbrain, pons, and medulla. Okay, so that's where they come out. Nerve contains axons. And they can be sensory, motor, or both. Another important thing for tests and things like that. So don't be caught into this, oh, you got a sensory nerve here and other things in the nerve. Again, nerve is a fossil. A neuron is a sensory neuron. It can be a motor neuron. But the nerve packaged together, the fossil thing, can be combinations. And, yes? Um, are you saying that cranial nerves are paired bilateral input? Yeah, they're going out each side of the okay. brain, the, wherever they're going out of, from the brain stem and the spine. Okay. So it says comments down here. Do not memorize. That's something that Patty Allen put in her stuff here, and I'll go, okay, I'm not going to torture you. Otherwise, you can go, one is ten, and just learn all those things. Okay, so the brain stem structure and function, midbrain controls reflexes, and this is always the thing because it's the midbrain, uh, which is what? The top part, it's, it's letting you be able to see things, it's orienting. So again, as we look at the midbrain and the cerebellum, if you're going to be walking down the street, if you're going to be driving, these are the parts of your self that are doing. And where can alcohol really affect? <laughs> Starting down at the midbrain and the cerebellum. Ponds, the crossover tracks between the two spheres. Respiration, blood vessels. Now we're getting a little more kind of the automatic, automated things going on, but it's still the thing of being able to work with what's going on. So the, bon the pons does that. The medulla oblongata, the medulla is also respiration, also swallowing, basics, and then again, it's what triggers if you chemical certain come in, the medulla, medulla uh, oblongata can go, okay, vomit it out. And sneeze, and cough. Basic things that are going on, that if you could control them, you'd really work on it. Okay, uh, this is the reticular activating system, the RAS. Okay, and it really specifically shows here that the RAS then is in the brain stem, and it starts down in the spinal area and goes all the way through with the midbrain, the, the medulla, the, the midbrain, the pons in the midbrain, and it's going through all of those things and it's coming up, and where's it then going to? Thalamus, hypothalamus, limbic system. So it's going into that, and it's going out to all these things, all these parts. Now, the point of this diagram is kind of, oops, they forgot really to show it also going the other way. It can go down through into the, the brain stem with the uh, all the little various parts and things going on there. So it's an important to understand from this diagram, it doesn't just go, brain, this is what's going on. It's the brain's coming back down and telling it what the things to do. And the fact that it ends in the thalamus, hypothalamus, and the limbic and parts of the cerebral cortex. So the simple thing, or the Lower level processing here is then going to be going to all the other places up in the rest of the brain. Okay, consciousness. Consciousness, definition. Definitions are so critical. You guys were interesting on the, on the uh, exam. 
because sometimes you'd use every word that I wanted you to use except for the one that I exactly wanted you to use. <laughs> but I still would give okay. Okay, what is, what is anatomy? Structure. What is physiology? Function. And you guys could come up with all different words instead of structure and function. You still God was okay, but as things go progressing, especially to the final exam, it may be understood. Anatomy is structure. It, it makes it easier for me to grade the written test, too. I'm looking through this whole thing and going, oh, it, what works, it's what moves, it's what, okay, i got to go for this. It was torturous sometimes. Fun, but torturous. Okay, subjective awareness of the external world and self. It's important for all of that. Subjective, not objective, you can't just it. Subjective awareness of the external world and self. States of consciousness. Maximum alertness, which generally doesn't occur in this class, I know. Wakefulness. Ah, if I can get you that level, good. Sleep. Yep, several types. I don't mean, I mean if you guys hear as well as there are several types of sleep. And then coma. I'd hopefully nobody's hit the coma part in here. Okay, where, where is uh, drugs? When you're, knocked out, when you're put to sleep, when you're having surgery or whatever, where are you? You're right down here, close to coma. That's why they pay the anesthesiologists such big bucks. Because you're, they put you right next to death. It's a very interesting job. Right. Okay, sleep. Sleep is an active process. I love that. It's just there's sentences that I've read from this book that's been a while since I've covered things on sleep. I'm kind of going, this is kind of neat. Okay, and here you have the neural systems that control it are the RAS, particular uh, associative system. Okay, hypothalamus and the brain stem. Okay, and here are some basic information here that would be fairly helpful. And if you read through it, you'll find out that it is fairly straightforward. It's not overwhelming. It's things that you can be aware of. Okay, and in particular, paradoxical sleep. I learned it as REM sleep. Am I that old? Did the rest of you have they heard? They talk about REM sleep in the lab, so... Okay, they do? Oh, good. Yeah, I don't feel so bad. I mean, here it is down here. Rapid eye movement. Okay? But they call it paradoxical sleep because you're coming in and out of it, in a sense. You're not just always in it. So it's kind of there, but it's not. It's kind of there, it's not. And so paradoxical, I think, is a horrible word. Nevertheless, it's what you guys got to learn. And I got to remember. So you have slow wave sleep, which is the general thing. S display slow waves. Slow wave sleep, display slow wave. This, this isn't overwhelming. Paradoxical, similar to the EEG. And I hear you folks had an EEG this week in lab of a, a wake person. So it, it's, it's kind of. Th and what's often interesting here is that the. Uh, uh, where is the one that is this? That here, the percentage of sleep time, most of it is. Slow sleep. Uh, sleep are hard to arouse, but apt to wake up spontaneously. Weird things. This is fun. You figure out how you, well you can sleep. Okay, circadian rhythms. Okay, skim these little pages here very lightly, and then you can get an idea. Circadian rhythm, 24-hour light-dark cycle. Controlled in part by the pineal gland. And it was nice that they put down here that it's a secretion of the hormone melatonin. And melanin is the skin pigment. Melatonin is the <coughs> hormone. Okay, so that's very helpful with you to be able to figure. And with this big, huge, giant graph here, which is from this pages from up here, it's just commenting about the increase in secretion in the dark. So it's what goes up here. It's the melatonin that is dark here. It's hard for me to see it on that one. Hopefully you guys can see it on that one. The little arrow is pointing up. And so the melatonin uh, increases in the dark. And melatonin is good for sleep. sleep. You can go buy it at the store if you're having a little trouble, then take some extra little melatonin and it can help you think. And again, in the future, it may be a little assignment that you guys have is what cocaine can do, what melatonin can do, what that kind of thing. So that would be, I even had a request from the audience. They said you guys would like to have specifics as to how it relates to things that you're actually doing out there. 
Okay, spinal cord is the central nervous system. So, the spinal cord, we've had these things before, spinal cord's coming down. It's this picture here that gives you some of the awareness. We've covered where the cerebral spinal fluid and all. It's this one here. You have the, um, the disc, and then the spinal cord is going down through this little hole. Pardon? So it's going down there. And if you've ever seen the, the, the cow bones, the deer bones, or something out on the thing, and you go, what's that little hole there? That's where the spine goes down. Okay? And this, this part is what? What is this side of the body? Okay, and I put some other thing. I was playing with it, uh, doing some of the stuff. I don't know if it's for the other or the next thing or whatever. But I, I put a little shark on it because what does the shark have? A dorsal fin. Okay, so if you want to walk around with a fin on you to remember dorsal side, that's the dorsal side. Okay, so these spines then uh, are on the dorsal side, and that's the side that the uh, spine goes through, that the spinal cord goes through. Okay, you don't need to know the numbers of the vertebrae, you have that in anatomy. But yeah, you do need to be aware that there are the five groups, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and cockajewel. Okay. I think it's important to know these great numbers, but I don't think it's important enough for exam. Okay, white matter. White matter is mostly composed of myelin axon. That's why it's white. And fewer cell bodies or synapses. It's called a track. Okay? And what is the white matter? What's a track? What's its major component? It's not the computer side of thing. It is the transmission side. It's the, where the information is being sent. Okay, so you have function is to convey the information from one place to another. It's mostly on the outside of the spinal cord inside the spine. Did I lose you? Because I, I had to put these things in there because I was kind of going. This is the spinal cord so the bone part is out here. The spine is around here. So this is inside the spine inside the spine, but it's outside part of the spinal cord. Did I get everybody there? I had to put the outside and the bit and the blue and the thing in there to go. Okay, so that gives you the, a basic orientation of the spinal cord going through the spine. Okay, now you have ascending uh, sensory tracts. The ascending sensory tracts are these blue and the descending motor tracts are green. Do I have to tell you that if you open the body out, they're not blue and green? <laughs> but it is pretty that it, they do that for you. Okay, uh, each tract begins at a certain level of the spinal cord, and each tract is a column to a specific region of the spinal cord or brain. Otherwise, if you had something here, it would be different over here and whatever it is. So in other words, I've said this before, each track starts at a place and goes to a track, a place, where it starts at a place and goes to a place. So they, they're always the same. And if you were able to find that in each little brain, you'd be able to, you know, you know that commercial on where somebody's doing something for a travel thing and the surgeon's up there and he's hitting his little things and the guy's going like that. <laughs> they could do that because why? Each one is its own track. It's going to be its own track. Can they really do that? No, it's cute on the commercial. Okay, know the location and function of the spinal cord of the gray matter. It's inside. Okay, so the bone of the spine's around here. Say, so, oh, here it is. Here we got a thing. So here's the bone of the spine down here, and here's inside is the, the spinal cord things all the way down here. Okay. So, and it is the, the ganglion is the matter that is a cluster of neuron cell bodies. There's a ganglion. And the gray matter is mostly on the inside. And what's the gray matter do again? The computer. It integrates the information. It's uh, unmyelinated. That's why it's gray. It tends to be gray. Okay. And emphasizing things, here is the dorsal horn. Dorsal horn is over here. Lateral horn is here. Ventral horn is here. Where's the dorsal side of it? 
the shark parts up here. So this is the top part. This is the front part down here. Okay, so the dorsal horn. Here's a somatic sensory afferent neuron. It's also going through a ganglion here, by the way, that's just shown. We'll cover that. So it goes in, and where it hooks on to the interneuron is inside the gray matter. And why is it inside the gray matter? Because it's doing a little bit of computing. In this little part, because there's an interneuron here, it is computing something. What is it computing? The signal from this, down the axon, is hooking on to this presynaptic and other thing, and it's going to be working on something and figuring out what to communicate across to this thing. So in the dorsal horn, you have the dendrite cell bodies. Oh, and where's Amy? Amy? Right here. Amy. Okay. She sent me an email and was kind of asking, where are things and does everything have dendrites and all this stuff? And I had to go in and look at some information things on that too. So what occurs is, is that does the somatic sensory afferent neuron have dendrites? Yeah, it does. Now, I sent back to Amy thing that the information that was there said you can have kind of one little place in some specific receptor for the afferent neuron. Does that make sense? But generally, they're little like dendrites that we're familiar with. And it comes down then, and the cell body is where? It's hanging off somewhere. Well, not exactly hanging off, but it's just not, it's not the cell body that we're, it's the standard one that we look at for an efferent that has the dendrites, the cell body in it, and then the axon going out. So the cell body is hanging way down on here. And I'll show you in a minute because it's in the, the ganglion pigs. So it comes in in the dorsal horn, and it then the um, it innervates then to the interneuron. The near interneuron then is going on the lateral horn, and the dendrites then come out and hook on to the efferent neuron. Oh, well that's interesting. It's showing by this that it's not going to the brain. Is there a hook here to the brain? It's not showing it on this because why? This is in the spinal cord, and your spinal cord is thinking. Well, not exactly thinking. It's responding to the signal. And it can come out and hook onto the dendrites of the autonomic motor efferents and go, boom, and send the signal down. Okay? So we got all that information there. You got dorsal side, dorsal horn. This comes in the dorsal horn. It doesn't even go down to the lateral. Just right in that little part, meets up, interneuron, then it meets up with the um, the automatic motor efferent neuron and it's sending signal. So the at signal, the afferent is coming at it, the efferent, the effector is going out. So it's not like a reflex. Ah! Somebody's figuring it out. Very good. We're heading that way. We're hopefully heading that way fairly quickly. Oh good. We're doing fairly reasonable. It's amazing when you have all these slides you got to go through. You kids are being tortured by them too. So, okay, pairs of spinal nerves. Again, each side. It's showing this side coming off, but there's things going off on that side because they wanted the label. It's just don't think there's just one side of things going off. Otherwise, we'd be having a problem. Okay, spinal nerves exit in the regions called, as I said, you need to be aware, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, spongy. That's the information. You don't need to know the numbers. You need to know the areas where they come out. Here's the fossil. Okay. Oh, here's my chart. Okay, so dorsal. Each spine divides right next to the spinal cord into two roots, a dorsal and a ventral. Composition of the uh, fossicles, somatic sensory afferent, somatic motor efferent, and some have both. Said that about things going through the brain stem too. You can have motor cir uh, circuits, um, sensory circuits and both. On nerves, what about, what about a neuron? Whatever it is, is what it is. It's either a motor or it's a sensory or whatever, but it can't be doing both things. Okay, here's more with the axon. 
Again, we're familiar with the axon enters the spinal nerve and goes only through the dorsal root. Er, stops right there. This is the afferent comes in, er, stops there. Right. Sensory afferent comes in, stops, hooks on to the uh, cell body. Okay, oh, oh, the cell body. Is, oh, here's where the cell body. The cell body here is in the dorsal root ganglia. So remember, we said that the cell body in the efferent sensory nerves is down here with the dendrites, but in the afferent neuron, it's kind of up on the gang on the axon. So the axon's coming up, goes into the dorsal, <coughs> it stops there. It innervates onto the interneuron and continues on. And it's axon term. All things are for the afferent is in the dorsal side. With the somatic um, motor efferent, it is on the ventral horn. So it's on this side. And there's the ventral. It comes across the interneuron. And now it's efferent. Coming in at it is the afferent. Coming away from it, it's affecting the nerve or the gland. And it's coming away from it on the ventral side. Are we all dorsal and ventral out? Okay. As I say, the reflex. So this is the simplest reflex then. The reflex arc of things were there. Okay, so you have, in this case, it's for more pain than anything else. You touch. You have the thermal pain receptor. Afferent pathway goes in, and at this time you notice it's getting a little more complicated in here. In fact, let me make it more bigger and complicated. Coming in, it's coming in on the dorsal side. It comes in, and my goodness, we've got pluses and minuses and things to beat the band. What occurs is it's coming in, afferent's coming in. It now can hook up to a variety of things. Oh, and what did they put in here? They put in a little circuit where some of these dendrites, uh, uh, the, uh, the axons come out, and they hook on to a signal that goes to the brain. Well, it's convenient. Now you know your finger hurts, but what's going on elsewhere? What else is going on is that you wind up coming in and one particular signal goes down to the biceps and what happens if you're touching something hot? Biceps work. Okay, so you have the signal, it comes down and it is the axon potentials. Well, we've had a bunch of that stuff, haven't we, over the last month. The axon potentials are triggered and the biceps come up. What happens to this other signal? They nicely, conveniently put it in red where this is green. This is green for go. The biceps go. It sends another signal really nicely. It's an inhibition. And it sends it to the triceps. So the biceps go and the triceps don't. That's convenient because otherwise, if they were fighting each other, you'd keep your finger on the hot burner. I, go, I, can't, I, just, don't, I just don't know what to do. You get that picture? So that's really convenient for our spinal cord to compute that and do it all on its own. Otherwise, if it came up to us, we'd be going, what am I supposed to do? Okay. So you got the signals for what's going on on the reflex arc. And you got all the keys you can look at and follow all the little purple wires or the blue wires and the black wires and all the things going on. But there's the, the, the reflex arc. <coughs> Okay, the types of reflexors are defined by the time of development. Early, this is the time of development of what the, you're learning, what the things, uh, as you grow up. Early, simple or basic are inherited. You're born with them. So the early ones are simple or basic inherited. Later are acquired or, con or conditioned. You learn, driving a car, gymnastics, taking exams, horrible things. Site, site of integration, okay, time of development, site of integration, another one, spinal reflexes, cranial reflexes, in the red spine, in the brain. Effectors, how they're controlled, somatic, skeletal muscle, <coughs> autonomic, generally what we don't have to work with, uh, think about. This is what the spine and the other work for us. Once again, oh, we're back to that stimulus, receptor, afferent pathway, integrator, efferent pathway, effector, response. 
Oh, you're going to be you're haunted again. It's still building on things. And this is the stretch reflex. So the re stretch reflex, you hit the knee, and again it can come up. And in this case, what is the receptor? It's a mechanoreceptor, not a pain thing that goes ouch. This is the uh, mechano, so the thing is stretched, boom, it has a response. And where are you hitting it here on the on the tendon? And so you hit the tendon and it just momentarily stretches the muscle. And by stretching the muscle through the tendon, this isn't you're doing anything, it's just stretching the muscle. The mechanoreceptor goes boom. And it sends a signal to we're still just dealing in the spine. Yeah. Comes up, says, yo, guess what? There is a signal that's going on. You got stretched here. It comes up. And so it goes, oh, got to correct itself. Why is that important? Otherwise, they fall down. Okay? So it's not just having cute little things of having your knee backed up. It's how we're standing here and sitting and not falling down too much. Okay, with this withdrawal pain. So you have, again, with the stimulus, you have the receptor, you have the afferent pathway, integrating center. Okay, going on with that, efferent pathways, the effector. Oh, covered all that, okay? Familiar with that? Reciprocal innervation is where you have one side that makes it happen and another side that inhibits it, makes it not happen. With a reflex, was there any reciprocal innervation? No, but it's just a jerk. It's one reason why it's so uncomfortable when they do that. It's, it's just kind of one muscle is just going, I'm going to pull it. But in reciprocal innervation, for example, when you pull your hand away from something hot, you're in a position of one is being um, created, one was being caused, the, the contraction, and the other is relaxed. Okay, so now we have the withdrawal reflex. Again, reciprocal innervation, it comes up, and in this case, you're stepping on a nice little tack. Ow. Okay, you got the stimulus pain, the pain receptor is in, in the right foot, the afferent pathways, the integrator, in this case the integrator is here, and continues on with the uh, somatic sensory a uh, afferent neurons. Um, and notice here that in the spinal cord, the same somatic sensory nerve synapses on inhibitory neuron, which synapses on somatic motor efferent neuron to the right leg. That's coming up. This is reciprocal innervation. And big time then, what occurs? If you step on something, what does your body do and why do you feel uh, slip on ice, for example, even with that? Now, I don't know if anybody had that great thing. It's colder up where I am this morning, but um, what goes on? You step on something and you have an owl. Well, your spinal cord has the first little part of the owl. Well, the receptors in the foot have the first little part of the owl. But, so you step on it and then what happens with your right leg? If I'm stepping on something with the right leg, what occurs? You're going to come. It's generally the quads that are going to be the ones that are contracts. Okay? So you're going to be coming up. You're going to be pulling on it. These are being um, activated. They're, the signal is coming up to them so that if you step on it, here's the right leg. Here's the right leg again. The signal is coming up. And in this case, it is inhibiting uh, one set of muscles and it is creating things on the other set of muscles. In which case, so things are relaxed on one, and boom, you can pull up. Can they do it on either one, though? Because if it contracted the hamstring, then you pull your leg backwards? Well, in a sense, yeah. Oh, if you're talking about thing, yeah, that could be with that. But in this case, it still has to be the one up here pulling. And in this case, it's showing that if I, I did this the other week, and it comes down, and it is, in this case, relaxing this muscle. Okay. Oh, no, this is contracting. Oh, I'm sorry, this is contracting and this is relaxed. So I've got to follow the little greens and the, and the reds. Okay? So you have the muscle then that's coming and pulling. So, yes, thank you. So you have the withdrawal reflex. 
But now on this picture, we're showing right foot and right foot again. But what then occurs is, is that this crossed extensor reflex is having it where you step on this, this foot's pulled up, but are you going to fall down flat on your face? Well, okay, now the crossed extensor reflex has to come in. And so in this case, it is in a position where the flexor muscle on the opposite, on the opposite leg relaxes and the extensor muscle of the opposite leg contracts. And if you've ever had that feeling where you step on something and your leg is, you, you, your leg is there, you didn't think about it, but your, your left leg tightened up and sometimes it'll cramp up and you feel really bad. <laughs> but that's the position. You're stepping with one, the reaction, reflex. But on this side then, you have the crossed extensor reflex. So that's the whole picture of what's going on where you have an afferent pathway and efferent pathways. And so from here, it also is crossing over and you also have a signal that's going to the brain saying, yes, you stepped on a tack. Okay, any questions then on that? Yeah, um, in cerebral palsy, Yes. With cerebral palsy, how does that, does that originate in, well, I guess if it's cerebral. Yeah, um, if it's cerebral, it's things in the brain that aren't coordinating things. So, with, so it starts within the brain, yeah. and the reaction is... Well, cerebral is, is the ongoing action. Right. Whatever, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm aware that Parkinson's in particular is is not letting the muscle, it's making it extra tony. So whenever right. you're doing something, it's always right, going back and forth. Uh, but I know in cerebral palsy, their, their brain is normal uh, aside from the movement. Yeah. Okay, so again, what we have here, reciprocal innervation, somatic sensory afferent neuron, synapses on excitatory neurons, which synapse on the somatic motor efferent neuron going to the left leg quadriceps muscle. Okay? And the same uh, somatic sensory inhibits with the other muscles. And it is uh, crosses to the other side of the spinal cord. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, That's it. Okay. Um, with the exam, um, it was an experience for me <laughs> uh, when I first was grading the the scantrons uh, when it goes through the scantron machines it marks off which ones were incorrect and it makes a horrible noise each time and so I was going oh this is making horrible noises each time well, even if you miss three or four, you're going to make a horrible noise. <laughs> um, I thought many did very well, and I think it's because you did study hard. I'd like to say it's because I was able to... Brilliant lecture, but I'm hoping getting better and better as I go along. Um, if people have particular questions with their grades, let me know. Again, I'm here early, before the class, and then we can see about scheduling things right after the class or at another time. Um, did everybody get their grade on it? And is, is Caitlin McIntyre here? Okay. Okay. If you, do you see her at other times then? Okay. If you do, let her know that she doesn't exist on my roll now. So. Um, are there any other particular questions then on the test, on the exam? Um, there are some students that didn't even bother with the bonus question. And I don't understand that. Um, the bonus question was for bonus. And what it turns out is that with the bonus question that what you're able to do is to help out a lot with the multiple choice. 
Um, uh, two of the multiple choice questions I threw out, uh, one of them I had correct on my key, but when I marked out, and as I sympathize with you guys marking out the scantrons, I marked the scantron wrong. And so it gave, and I couldn't understand why 63% of the people were missing one particular problem. So um, what occurred then is I, so I took that one out. So it was graded on the 48. I gave you the benefit of the other two. And if I had an entertaining time on the essay question. For those that didn't even answer some questions, that made me sad. For those that answered them with some of the funnest information, and even on the uh, action potential diagram. Some of you had the strangest things for the Y axis, and so you've lost a couple points there. Sometimes then I would give extra credit in the essay question for when you elaborated and gave additional information. You could give the basics on the action potential, repolarization, hyperpolarization. You could give the basics and you'd get credit for it. But when you started the really elaborate, and some of you, again, I'd like to say I taught you that, but no, I'd have to say some of you did learn a lot. And I do appreciate that. Now, some then have let me know that because of problems and things, not being able to study, and there are five test and they will, three of them, uh, two of them can be dropped and so go with the, the top two. So if you hold on, things will things. And I think in many ways this first part is the most difficult, what we already did is the most difficult on, you don't see an action potential. You don't see things. But I think if I can show you that you can have a gate and things can jump across, use the dorsal root and the the ventral root and all that stuff. I think those things are mainly memorization. So we shall see how things go from there. Any other particular questions? Okay. Is Jeremy?